British politics. Uh, and um, the School of Geography, Politics and Sociology at Newcastle University, and was the lead researcher on the Climate Assembly UK and a member of Scotland's Climate Assembly research team. And we have um, Justin Kenrick here with us as well, who's an anthropologist working on reclaiming democracy with grassroots to global assemblies and on community land rights in Africa. Um, he writes extensively and was on the stewarding group of Scotland's Climate Citizens Assembly for Extinction Rebellion until XR decided it had to leave. And Eva Schoenfeld, who's a climate activist, writer, and process designer and facilitator. She's the co-founder of Heart Politics, which is currently working on a fractal grassroots to global process which aims to connect open-hearted listening and creative culture redesign with collective decision-making processes that enable meaningful change. And so I think we'll have quite a rich conversation here tonight. Um, what I'd like to start with is um, Nadine and then Stephen, um, each giving us a, a brief overview. So Nadine, if I could hand over to you to give us an overview of the, the climate assembly itself. Yeah, hi, um, and thanks everyone for coming. So um, it does feel like quite a long time uh, since the assembly actually happened. Um, but if you cast your minds back, um, it ran from October um, to the end of March. So October 2021 to March 2022 was the main assembly period. Um, and, and for that, um, there were seven weekends. And then um, there was an eighth weekend, which was then held the following January after the Scottish government had uh, given its response. So um, where did the assembly come from? It was part of the Climate Change Act. Um, that there should be a climate assembly um, and that a secretariat should be set up, um, made up of uh, seconded civil servants. Um, there was a stewarding group of which um, Justin was a member for a time, uh, representing XR along with a colleague. And, um, and then there was um, an evidence group who pulled together um, all the evidence presentations that were given to the assembly members um, and then the design and facilitation team who then actually you know um, hosted the the weekends and and um, did all the facilitation and the design aspects so that was the assembly um, all the evidence that the members were presented with is available on on YouTube so if you've not already seen it um, you know you can go there look for Scot Scotland's climate assembly and you, you can find most almost everything that they were presented with they are um, so the assembly was tasked with um, addressing a question uh, which was how should um, Scotland um, change to tackle the climate emergency in an effective and fair way so that was the question um and uh you know so this is what they did over over the seven weekends and then they they produced um in may i think it was uh or april um an interim report and then the full report was then um presented to was laid in, in parliament in june so six months after the, the scottish government had six months in which to respond and they did that in the december um, with one week to go before the end of the six months um, and then, as I said, the final weekend happened um, in, in early February, I think, um, where the, the members then, you know, discussed the Scottish government response and made their own response to the Scottish government response. So that's a kind of, so the, the, there was roughly 105 members, a few sort of came and went. Um, only kind of three or four actually sort of left. Um, and they were recruited to be um, broadly representative of Scotland's population by, you know, key demographics. So 
Um, now accompanying the actual assembly was this research project, um, which I worked on from a Scottish government perspective alongside Stephen from Newcastle University. And uh, so I'll hand over to Stephen to say a bit more about uh, what the research was about and how that ran, Stephen. Thanks so much today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, so the research we were interested in the internal aspects of the assembly. So what happened uh, inside the assembly? So and Nadine said about the different type of information that was provided to the assembly members. To what extent did they learn through that process? Did they learn and get a better understanding about climate change? Did they get a better understanding about um, climate change action? And did they deliberate? This is a specific form of communication that um, citizens' assemblies in general are sort of meant to be designed to bring about. It's meant to be inclusive, that everyone should have a say. It's meant to be respectful, that uh, we, we listen to what other people have to say genuinely and sincerely and, 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 and take that on board. And it's meant to be reasoned in that when we put forward our own views, we justify why we think that they're the right action um, with reasons. So we wanted to see whether that deliberation did indeed happen in, in, in this assembly. We wanted to see what the effect of this learning, the information and the deliberation had on um, the assembly members' opinion around climate change and climate action. Um, also their behavior, you know, are they gonna be more politically active after the assembly? Were they gonna be change their um, behavior around, um, uh, you know, climate? And what was the overall emotional response to engaging in assembly on such a, a topic like this? And then finally, how did all this feed into the recommendations, the decisions that they made? So that's the first dimension, the internal dimension. We're also interested in the external dimensions. How did the assembly re relate to other parts of the Scottish political system? Uh, the, the Scottish government, which obviously initiated it, and, and parliament. Um, did it have an effect on, on policy? Were the public aware of it? And if so, what do they think to the Assembly? Um, did it in any way guide or lead their opinion? And, and in order to achieve that, what was the, the media coverage like? So we're also interested in the relationship between those two dimensions. Um, and part of it was, the aim of the research was to feed into the Assembly. So we were producing briefings in between weekends throughout the Assembly. They were going to the assembly organizers in with the aim of not just understanding what was happening with the assembly, but having a positive effect, giving them an evidence base to make design decisions for the, the later weekends. Um, and it was also aimed at trying to, you know, this is the second citizen assembly Scotland has had now. There's plans for more. Um, we want to feed into that debate again, provide an evidence base for them to be able to. Uh, do these better if possible and also just contribute to sort of global evidence base as well so there's we're seeing a wave of climate assemblies or a big increase in climate assemblies across Europe in particular um, and would like the Scottish example the evidence provide an evidence base where people can, can learn from that um, in order to do this then methods wise, I mean, it was mixed method study, which effectively means we did um, quantitative methods and qualitative methods and combined them. We surveyed the members at various points throughout the process. We watched all the sessions and we interviewed the, the expert witnesses and, and the various organizers, the stewarding group, etc. We did a, a survey of the population to capture whether they were aware of it. We analysed the small group discussions within the assembly. We analysed the evidence presentations the expert witnesses provided. We looked at other secondary data, such as the report the assembly produced, other Scottish government documents, and we also analysed the media. So lots and lots of different data sources and what that helps us do is basically triangulate which um the the easiest way to explain triangulate is if it looks like a duck swims like a duck sounds like a duck it's probably a duck so if we've got lots of different data sources indicating a certain type of finding then that just increases our confidence in the reliability of that finding great thank you Stephen. 
And then um, Eva and or Justin, um, would one of you like to say a few words or both of you, if you wish, on XR, climate assemblies, um, maybe something about the Green Party's take up of this as well? Yeah, I'm happy to go first and then pass on to Eva. I just make people know it's great to see you all. Fantastic you've turned up and it's a good chance to reflect. And we're going on a round here of just contextualizing. And then we're gonna look at the report itself, which I'm really looking forward to because it's a great report with really interesting stuff in it. Um, I'm an anthropologist. And so I kind of look at things over maybe a longer term or a, or a more immediate term. And one of the things that strikes me, I was looking at a recent uh, bit of research on young people's feelings about climate change. And it says that uh, three quarters feel the future is frightening. Over half believe that humanity is doomed. Close to two thirds feel the government's failing them and betraying future generations. So that's the kind of context in which this assembly happened. Context of, of really uh, deep feeling of fear about the future. And I would suggest this, it's not surprising uh, because really fundamental transformational change is what's needed and it doesn't ever look possible in any culture <laughs> you know change never looks possible when you look ahead you know you would never believe the berlin wall would come down or women would get the vote or whatever it always looks impossible but then when you look backwards you know look at what's happened in the past transformative change always looks inevitable so when you look forward it looks impossible when you look back it looks inevitable so the change in the present what makes the difference in the present is people being willing to take a stand being willing to push for transformation despite a kind of status quo which always inevitably wants the status quo to continue it's not anybody's fault if they're in the status quo firmly bounded in that position but that's where they're located and i guess there's something here about kind of culture persuades us that it won't change and yet cultures always change so i guess so i want to start off with that <laughs> bit of hope there in the sense that we're in a really drastic situation really really drastic if you look at the science it's absolutely appalling and yet change can happen but it can only happen from the ground up and what's interesting in the story of the climate assembly is that it's often told as if it was the result of a, an act of parliament you know which it was technically you know, a bill went through the Scottish Parliament, it was passed, and amendment was put to it by the Green Party, and that amendment said we will have a climate assembly. But in reality, before that, Extinction Rebellion had been, and Fridays for the Future, had been out on the streets, and we'd blockaded the North Bridge in Edinburgh, we'd occupied the Scottish Parliament. Uh, there was a vote in, in Parliament on whether to declare a climate emergency in March of uh, 2019, and uh, it was roundly defeated. And yet, a month and a half later, after our actions, the, Scottish, the SNP government declared a climate emergency. So you can see that change doesn't happen from the top. It's not handed down. It happens from below. And I guess that's just want to stress XR's role in making this climate assembly come about. So both in terms of being on the streets, in terms of talking with folk in the Green Party, in Friends of the Earth, in Commonweal, in Global Justice Now, in other key organisations, and suggesting to people that this was a worthwhile endeavour. Now, whether it is or not, I hope we'll uh, find out by discussing the report that's been made. That was great, just nothing, nothing to add. Okay, thanks everybody for that kind of introduction to the topic. Um, we now have a, a little um, space for each of us, um, Nadine, Stephen, Justin, Eva, and even me, to um, just briefly a couple minutes on which research findings we found the most interesting and why. Um, so this is just a space if any of you four would like to jump in on that, please go ahead. I guess I could kick that off seeing as I didn't speak last time. Um, well, I mean, I, I, again, um, reiterating Justin's appreciation of the report, it was very thorough and really interesting. Um, one of the things that stood out to me was something pretty fundamental, um, which was that the, the um, members of the assembly weren't given, well, given very little time at all to reflect on um, existing government policy um, around climate change. Um, and I think, there, I think there was, I think they got a kind of overview. And I understand that, that this is in the context of a an assembly that was fighting against time. They they had shorter sessions because um, because it was online and it was so intense for people, and they were really struggling to fit everything in. Um, but that this particular detail feels absolutely crucial to me, um, and one of the reasons why I think um, uh, assembly members were so disappointed with the government's response at the end 
because something like 80% of the recommendations that they made, maybe it was 60, bad at remembering numbers, but it was a high percentage, um, uh, the, the Scottish government said, well, we're doing that already. Um, and, and it seems to me that if the, if the uh, assembly members had been properly briefed on what the government's plans were, and that if the assembly had been more focused on uh, them assessing whether they considered those measures, the measures that the government was already signed up to, whether they were adequate or not, then the impact, the potential impact of the assembly would have been much bigger. Um, so I think that's a kind of uh, uh, a design flaw in the original uh, idea for the assembly. But I'm also here from Justin that, that there was uh, quite a lot of uh, insistence from the Extinction Rebellion in particular that that in, in fact this should be this should be included. Um, and uh, so it, it, it kind of was it wasn't it not included by mistake. It was deliberately not included. Um, which just seems to me a massive, massive missed opportunity. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's really important that it was flagged up so clearly in the, in the research. Thanks, Eva. Just following on from that, if that's okay. Um, so, yeah, so the, the fact that current climate change policy wasn't deeply considered, it, it, did, it did happen, that it was in there uh, to a very little degree uh, in terms of the update on the climate change plans, but it wasn't deeply considered. And that the fact that the level of crisis we're in wasn't deeply considered, and the fact that how, whether the government's response is adequate or not wasn't deeply considered, and therefore what you get is what's been described by some people in the report, uh, Nadine's and, and uh, Stephen's report, as being a kind of piecemeal, piecemeal bunch of recommendations which the government could kind of pick and choose from. So I guess that was, to me, that was quite a crucial part of the report was, was both well, two factors. So one was the way in which, and again, there are different voices in the report. Okay, so I'm I'm picking out the voices that I agree with, right? So I'm just being straightforward about this. There were voices in this report that say the secretariat, which is mostly civil servants, seconded to be the student, student group. Plenty of people there who say in the organising group that say they did a, did a fine job and they did work very very hard, and I acknowledge that. But you know, civil servants, by their nature, are design uh, um, uh, are going to be needing to toe a line that fits with government. And that's justified in terms of the, the uh, interviews in the report by saying, well, policy needs to be relevant, it needs to be applicable, it needs to be something, any recommendations need to fit with the existing policy. And I would really recommend pages kind of 29 through to 35 of the report, okay? Or if you've only got three pages, 33 to 35, because, sorry, I used to lecture in anthropology, so I know people don't necessarily read more than just a few. Once you've read those three pages, you might read loads more, so I recommend those pages. But in that, I think I, think I know who's saying this, but somebody's saying, one of the people on the organizing, uh, probably an expert, I imagine, on the organizing group saying, you know, we all agree we need to act within the science as long as it's not too disruptive. And the problem is that the secretariat think they're doing their job, which is to try and make this fit with uh, the kind of policies that we've got, uh, that the output needs to be uh, needs to be kind of useful, needs to be something that can fit with what the government's doing. And what, he's, what he or she says is, I think the output has got to be the correct output to the question as deemed appropriate by the people you're asking the question to. Whether the government deems that appropriate or not is almost an irrelevant issue. And this is the key point that I got from the report was just how much it was the assembly was framed to fit in with existing government policies and processes. Whereas actually the real debate that we've all got inside ourselves, not just in society, is how do we really respond to this emergency? How do we transform radically in response to this emergency while also knowing that's going to disrupt our lives? So we've all got an internal debate. You know, what kind of public transport do you use? I use private transport. You know, also, what do you eat? All sorts of things. We, really, we each got really drastic questions of ourselves all the time, whether we're asked them or not, about how much we're gonna disrupt our lives to respond to the emergency. So that, that's a question in a sense, which could have been there at the heart of this process. People presenting the views of a really radical change that's required and what that would involve, and those presenting the views that says, say we can't make very much radical change. But that was a kind of hidden process within, the pro within this. And I think that came through for me anyway, quite clearly in the report that it was very much shaped by a secretariat that was fitting things into existing government policy when actually what was here was a potential to pr present transformative policy. Cheers, Justin. I'll, I'll, um, <clears throat> I might follow on from that because it, it, it kind of flows a little bit. So. Um, one of our findings was that um, possibly <clears throat> um, the, the, the seriousness of climate change hadn't been fully emphasised to the assembly members in the in the first couple of weekends. Um, that that leads me on to um, 
talking about the emotional experience of members, which is what I'll probably focus on in these few minutes. Um, because of uh, coming from a climate psychology background, that's that's a, a, a big interest of mine. So we asked from from weekend two, we were asking in the member surveys um, questions around uh, the, the members emotional experience. And then we also included those questions in the population survey so we could see how um, both how the assembly members experience changed over the course of the assembly. Um, but also how that then compared with the population as a whole. And what is fascinating, um, I think, is how the assembly members had, so normally what you might expect to happen when um, people become more informed about climate change is they get more worried, right? Because they're they're learning about the, the, the reality of the situation. Um, what we found though, was that um, the, the assembly members had higher levels of hopefulness and optimism and lower levels of worry and overwhelm um, than the population as a whole. And they had, um, there was also a lower proportion that reported that their emotions about climate change were having a negative impact on their mental health. Um, so you might think in one way, well, that's the opposite of what you might expect. But my view is that um, we also know that they were um, had, a, had quite a strong sense of purpose um, around this. And, um, and I think that it was, they, they had um, focus, you know, they had a particular task that they were being given to do that they felt was important, you know, and, and of um, national significance. Um, and I think that that sense of purpose um, was a was a way to sort of channel any negative emotions that they might have felt because they felt like they were doing something and they were doing something important. Um, so I think that that probably moderated um, any other uh, emotions like worry and so on. Um, and and also because some of them mistakenly <laughs> thought that the that the government is was required to actually act on their recommendations. Um, it, that was never <laughs> that was never part of what the, the assembly it, uh, it was only ever going to be um advisory but you know so, some people somehow held that view um possibly right until the end um and that might have also fed into their disappointment what was fascinating though was after the scottish government response in that weekend date in the february so this is almost you know eight nine months after the last nine ten months after the the, the last weekend that they had when we asked them that again, their their levels of lev of worry and and hopefulness and worry and were were, were back to being more similar to the population as a whole. <laughs> um, so their worry had increased basically, and their and their hopefulness and 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 optimism had decreased. Um, maybe you could say back to more realistic levels. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I find that really interesting because that's the first time that we've. Um, in, in climate psychology that we've looked at context specifically at people's emotional experience and, the, and different factors that might be contributing to that. Um, so that's one of the the, the, the the other findings which I think are interesting, but I won't go into big detail about now, but maybe in our discussion we'll come to, um, is about um, government culture. Um, and so it wasn't so much that this was um, a finding, it's more, in the conclusions chapter what we've included as some as a consideration um so how can um if if you know scottish government is going to continue to do assemblies of one type or another um and these are going to be institutionalized then um there needs to be a culture within government of um heeding recommendations that come from assemblies and learning lessons from them um, but also providing sufficient re resources to respond to and to implement the recommendations, because otherwise, what's you know, if you're paying for assemblies, but then you haven't got the money to to implement any of the recommendations that they produce that, that you want to that, that are good, then um, you know you could kind of ask what's the point. So I think these are kind of the key key areas that maybe. You know, when we talk more about the implications for, for Scotland going forward, um, might come back up again. 
but I'll, I'll hand over to Pam or Stephen next. Thanks. Um, so I agree with the comments from my um, fellow panellists. I've got things to say in response, but I think we're going to move to a more interactive element later. So I'll save responses to those, but they are all findings on the report. So I, I, I do agree with them. I anticipated that they would go more critical. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick out some of the more positive aspects of, of the assembly. The first thing is this is one of the, the first assemblies to be delivered entirely online. There's other ones that were part online and, and part in person. This one was entirely online. Um, and, and, and I thought they, it went very well considering that. And in fact, it brought advantages that we wouldn't have had otherwise. So I think different types of people were able to be included that couldn't if it had been an in-person um, assembly. I thought the way um, evidence was, you know, they were able to review the evidence presentations before they were put, given to the assembly members. Um, it enabled um, easier recruitment of uh, witnesses because they didn't have to be in, in a certain place at a certain time in order to, to provide the evidence. I thought the deliberation in general, I mean, there's elements in there where we talk about, in the report where we talk about is maybe more dialogue based and deliberation dialogue being, you're trying to understand the different positions which is obviously very useful, but deliberation tries to go a step further and tries to reconcile them as well. Um, and perhaps we saw less of that, but in general, in comparison to other um, in-person assemblies, quality of deliberations was, was, was still good. So yeah, there were some technical issues and things like that, but in general, that was very successful. So lessons that need to be learned is, is how to build in social elements online, which is, which is more difficult. But those social elements that you get from in-person meetings, they then underpin and provide the foundations and the grounding for good quality deliberation and the trust within the, amongst the assembly members that's important. Second point I wanted to raise was about the provision of evidence. Most of the climate assemblies we've seen across the world have, have focused entirely on mitigation. This is one of the few that try to also address adaptation and resilience. So that was an important thing. However, with the witnesses found that, that, that style of things, those aspects of the issue, very difficult to communicate to the assembly members and felt that they ultimately failed to do so. If you look at the assembly recommendations, they're nearly all mitigation related. So it suggests that that didn't resonate with the assembly members as well, which probably is part of how it's communicated. So we need to learn. So it was great that they tried to include adaptation but we need to think much more creatively about how we include things like that in terms of the evidence provision. At the moment where assemblies design, it's far too uh, sort of cookie, cut, cookie cutter approach of using the same methods every time basically. And we need to experiment more. People have different diverse learning styles, different types of it, issues, mitigation, adaptation needs to be communicated and taught uh, very differently. Um, so we need to move to more experiential formats of, of engaging with evidence as well and move away just from having talking heads followed by, by q and A, I I think. And then the final point, which we touch on in the, um, in the report, but actually I've, I've learned more as we started to try and draft some journal articles, we are looking into the data in a little bit more depth than we we're able to in the report. And on the public survey, so in, in the citizen assembly, at the end of the day, it's 100 people. So because of the small numbers, people suggest, well, actually, then can they take the, the general public with them? Can they act as a guide to public opinion more generally? In this case, no, but just simply because no one knew about it, just didn't get the media coverage to cut through. But nonetheless, when we surveyed the public, yes, they were aware of the, the assembly, but then when we asked them what they thought about it, what they thought about the recommendations, one of the things I found really interesting was that people who aren't particularly concerned about climate change still wanted to see the recommendations implemented. Now, we were analysing that data a bit further to try and get ahead around why, but it might be just because it was a citizens' assembly. And that, um, and, and that would be, that's an impressive thing if the citizens' assembly can take people who are, are not that concerned about the climate assembly and get them to support climate action more. So those are my three points. Thank you. 
thanks for that all. Um, and for me, just briefly, I throughout have been interested in how this can be applied in even more local settings. You know, I'm in Sterling. Could we have one in Sterling? Is it too expensive? Is it too hard to organize? All these questions. But equally, so the thread throughout for me was how do the people who are participating feel? Do they feel like they're participating in local democracy? Do they feel that the outcomes will have an impact, whether that's an impact on public opinion, um, so that you know, public the public can um, influence their elected representatives. But more importantly, would it have an impact on actual policy for the body that they were um, that the assembly was convened by? And so, for me. It's almost not the research findings, but the reality findings that I found uh, most interesting. Why would some people in Sterling, for example, give up their time over eight weekends to participate in such a process if nobody was going to listen at the end of it? And so for me, that, you know, that was um, the, my constant look at it throughout, how could this apply locally so we could have more local and more participative democracy taking place? And with that, it kind of has led us on a little journey straight to the next topic. In, in a little while, we're gonna open it up to the audience. So um, start thinking about what you might like to contribute or um, questions you might like to ask. But to start that off, um, we're just going to have a, a conversation now between the panel members. And um, I wonder if we can kick off with what are the implications of what took place for having more local, participative, deliberative, democratic conversations on a local basis? Would any of you four like to start us off with that? Maybe. I can leave. Oh, okay, go. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I went. I went in this order before. Would you like to jump in, Nadine? Because no. I, I guess I was jumping in partly because um, I, I've done a lot of speaking along similar lines, Pam, to you about how how um, democracy could be made more local, and in fact, that was kind of um, our response. Justin and me and a group of people who we're working with was our response to both this. Climate Assembly and the one that was held um, at, at Westminster set up very differently and um, but equally in our view as climate activists as disappointing in its out in its outcome um, uh, so what we've we have sort of been putting our minds to since then is we don't want to throw this these this assembly idea out with the bathwater we think that people coming together and really listening to one another and deliberating and hearing from a range of expert opinion is, is actually a really, really positive thing. Um, but it seems as though, and not surprisingly, um, government is, uh, is already so wedded to what it's already done, to what, to what it's already signed up to, to its spending um, for the next term and to its economic model in particular. Uh, that it's not really able to even let people consider the the um, the possibility of re of really drastic change, and frankly, that's what we're looking at at this stage. Um, we're looking at having to navigate our way down a cliff edge of climate emissions, where ten years ago there was this, you know, on the graphs showing how how our emissions could go down. We had a a nice walkable slope. Um, it, the longer that we leave it, the more of a cliff edge we have to navigate. So this is this means drastic change. Um, and we are, have been looking at and experimenting and piloting um, assembly processes within communities. 
But this question of who's going to listen and where do these assemblies go if they've, you know, we've had a fantastic assembly in a community where people have managed to kind of get right down to root causes and really deliberate, really listen to one another, think creatively together, and they've come up with some really great ideas. What does it matter if actually government is not able to listen? Um, so what we are looking at is uh, or the kind of framework that we're using at the moment is this idea of, of the pathways that come out of assemblies. Um, so the, there are kind of gen, three general pathways that come out of assemblies. And one is the kind of traditional uh, transition network one, where local people have managed to meet up. They've seen that something needs doing in their community. There's nothing to stop them doing it. So they go and they do it. They set up a community orchard or a, or a local market. Um, something that raises quality of life for local people and also potentially cuts carbon as well, certainly builds resilience. So that's the first pathway. The second pathway is one where, again, which is a well-worn track where pe local people have to interact with power, um, power holders of one sort or another. So that's whether that's local authority or central government or people with money who might give you a grant. Um, that's, that's the second pathway. And the third pathway is the one that we're most interested in, which is, is a new pathway. It's the one that we make ourselves, where, where we as citizens uh, claim responsibility uh, and connect up the outputs of our assemblies, first at local level and then at regional and national level, so that we're, what, we're, what we're looking at the possibility of is citizen-led citizens' assemblies. Now, again, there's still a gap between a, a, a group of citizens claiming responsibility um, or stepping into responsibility and a government um, who, who feels that it's legitimate because it's part of a, a voting system. But there's, that's at least a conversation um, that, could, hap that, that could, could happen. And, you know, uh, unfortunately at the moment we probably can't afford the kind of high quality research um, that people like Nadine and, and Stephen could bring. Um, but it may well be that over time, if this model that we're working with can build, uh, that we can build, and we certainly are really interested in evaluation, um, in how you make sure that these processes that are run at community level are, are really high quality, even though they're incredibly shoestring budget. Um, so for me, that is, so for me, the, the impact of this assembly was to make me lose what little vestige of hope I had in government being able to uh, take the kind of decision that's necessary in this situation and step into a kind of creative, if, uh, if outrageously ambitious response. But I think at this stage that we're at, that is the only kind of response that we have. And if we can galvanize people's hope and enthusiasm for, for actually taking, taking responsibility into our own hands, then we could have the beginnings of a really, really interesting and powerful and effective social movement. So. I, could, uh, I could follow on, um, but more really to respond to some really helpful things that Nadine and, and Stephen were saying, which were, I mean, Nadine talking about the emotional roller coaster that people were on, or maybe it's not a roller coaster, but that that return to a state of um, not being hopeful. Let's put it mildly. Um, at the end of that process, which seems to be very connected to the fact that um, you know the, the assembly members were really disappointed with the government's response. They were disappointed that nothing really seemed to be shifting. Government seemed to be just fobbing them off rather than actually responding seriously. And and then it's that emotional process. I mean, whether there's a commitment to, the, to actually doing something or not seems to be a very strong reason as to whether you would feel it worthwhile to take part in an assembly in Stirling or in, in Scotland as a whole. And then Stephen talking about the kind of difference, well, I found that fascinating, the difference between dialogue and deliberation, which I didn't really understand <laughs> before, but just this notion that when you're in dialogue, you're listening to each other's viewpoints with respect and in deliberation, you're really trying to go deeper than those viewpoints. You're trying to get somewhere else. You're trying to build. You're trying to actually find a, a deeper place of connection and, and therefore, in a sense, move forward from your positions rather than be right and persuade somebody else that, you're, that they're wrong. And so I thought what Nadine was bringing there around the emotional side and what Stephen was bringing around deliberation, both highlight the importance of this kind of space. But the issue for me comes back to something, Pam, you said, which is about who is convening this. Like, if you think of this as being convened by the government, and if the government is basically there to uphold the status quo, that's its job, that's what it does, it kind of persists, you know, in that way, that 
then, then we get nowhere. In France, this, the citizen assembly that they had was definitely very clearly emerging out of the Yellow Vest and the Extinction Rebellion and climate campaigns. It was very clearly being convened by society at large with the government having to hold it in response to a social movement. And that's in a sense what we need is a social movement that will generate an assembly which has ownership from people generally and that is willing to deal with the fundamental issue, which is an economic system based on economic growth where lots of wealth goes to a few people and very little to people in the global south and governments are maintained in the global south who exploit people and if they don't they get shoved out of the way i mean it's a very brutal system we're operating within uh, and uh, there's plenty to go around and there's plenty of emissions to share around if we actually uh, share them around fairly so we can get down that cliff edge that you were describing but only through really rapid transformation but that requires a real deep conversation between people who are willing to face the realities of that. And that requires the kind of deliberation that Stephen was talking about, where everybody doesn't arrive with the same view, but everybody's really willing to listen to each other. You know, those who are saying we can't change a thing and then think through the consequences of that. Those saying we have to change through everything, think through the consequences of that. Those are both quite tricky situations. So I just suggest who convenes it, who's seen as convening it is really crucial to whether these are emotionally gonna be rewarding and gonna be rewarding to put your time into, or whether they're seen as a kind of glorified focus group that's just, a greenwashing process. Um, did you want to come in, Stephen? Because I know that um, you, you've also been involved on a more local level, haven't you? And um, and I can respond after you. Yeah, I mean, I think the key the key lessons. Um, I mean, actually, the, what the, the climate assemblies that have happened at a local level have, have tended to have more of a policy impact than the ones that we've seen so far at a national level. Um, but I think the key lessons from this assembly, and I think this will, to some degree, I think, go and, and help address Eva and Justin's concerns, but, but not completely. But So firstly, we need to democratise the assemblies much more. That um, You know, almost the assembly members being treated like an experiment, a treatment group where things are done to them and they're put through a process, that they need to be treated like assembly members, they're members of assembly, that they should basically be able to determine the questions that they're addressing and how they go about addressing it, including what evidence they feel that they need to receive in order to address that question. Secondly, we need to embed or institutionalize assemblies. We need to move away from them being ad hoc where a government can just decide to have one and then just decide to equally just to ignore it on the other hand as well. So I'm not going to go into what I think the rules should be, but just to say that I think we need rules about when they happen, how they happen, and then what happens to the recommendations uh, at, at the end so that they can't just be, you know, a political football, basically, um, as, as we've seen so far we need to get much better about how to communicate the assembly to the pu public and, and and budgets need to reflect that so so far the money goes into the assembly running but not to how it then plays out within the system as a whole and we need to be much more attuned to that but we can't just rely on the media then assembly designers need to engage the public directly themselves in terms of what, you know, setting the agenda, what should the assembly be addressing? This would come back to the rules I mentioned in terms of embedding them, but what should be the, um, what should the assembly be addressing? Members of the public should be able to submit evidence to be considered by that assembly, and there should be some sort of formal way for the public to engage with the recommendations as well. Um, and then, and finally, the key lesson is, we need to look beyond climate assemblies. We're, we're mistaken if we think that this is all that we need. We need lots of different avenues to get the public involved in climate change debate and climate policy debate and climate action. And I agree with Justin and Eva sort of saying like we want collective action, we want we want grassroots action. Absolutely like you know, fantastic. I applaud you in, in trying to do that. But I think any successful social movement also then needs, you know, it needs insiders and outsiders. So we need people in government who are li being listened to, people who are, who are more directly, you know, able to speak to, to government officials and, and get maybe a less radical message heard, but that does still support the more radical messages that can come through the grassroots. I think we need both, but we can't just... If, we're mistaken if we think that climate assemblies are going to solve the climate crisis. They can help, if, and, and, and hopefully the lessons I've just mentioned will help further, but we can't rely on them alone. 
Hmm. <laughs> so I, I think what I want to come in with um, responds to a, a, a few different things that, that that people have said. So on the on this kind of the, the local focus. Um, so I'm, I'm very much into um, place based approaches. Um, but the nature of mitigation is, is not local. M mitigation only works if the whole world does it. That's the, that's the dilemma, right? So what works really well on a local level is adaptation and, and you know, reducing vulnerability, increasing resilience to, to the impacts of climate change. Um, I think someone's got a got their microphone on. Um, um, so, so that's so that's one thing, I, and that's not to say that mitigation isn't important because, of course, it is. But whatever happens on a local level is is virtually irrelevant unless all of those things can can be added up to a, a global effort and that's where i think um something else that that that, that stephen um brought brought up uh, i don't think it's in the report but it's something that that you talked about stephen um which i hadn't considered before and which was to do with the shelf life of recommendations so if we are trying to um you know piece together different um processes that are happening on a local level and try and like as if they're kind of modules or something that then build into something bigger together um something greater than the parts there is the issue of how much time that takes and, and time lag um and whether you know some of the recommendations it's possible that already some of the recommendations in the climate assembly report are already out of date and um, some of them probably went out of date within a few months and um, so just throwing that one in the pot as well and so before we open it up to the rest of the group here tonight is there anything stephen justin eva you guys want to say? There's an infinite amount of number of things I'd like to say, but I won't say them because I'd like to hear everybody else. I guess just that last point that Nadine's making about the local, I, I think that's really right, except that what we need is lots of locals to add up to a global. We don't seem to see any leadership from nation states in terms of what's needed to be happening. We do see a lot of leadership from local communities, but local communities don't believe that they can take the action needed. So it's actually us believing that making the change where we are linking with others making the change where they are is what matters and I guess that's what we're looking at so this event we got on the 1st of October which you're all welcome to attend um rewilding as people from assemblies in Chile people from assemblies in East Africa and in Scotland thinking about how can we link up how can we make the change where we are how can we link up so it's a different theory of change but the one we've been trying hasn't worked let's try something new okay thank you for that and somebody's just asked for the link to the event, Justin, if you've got it handy. Okay, so for this next bit, I think um, the easiest thing for me, given there's two pages of us, is if you could um, just raise your hand if you want to talk or um, ask a question. And obviously feel free to put comments in the chat as well, and I'll try and keep up with those. So would anyone like to contribute to the conversation or ask a question of anyone on the panel? Or perhaps someone has experience of a local deliberative process that they'd like to share. Peter, Peter Moffat, but you're on mute. Your microphone is muted, Peter. I was wondering why, when Justin was talking about Extinction Rebellion, he didn't mention what I believe to be the fact that they walked out after about the second meeting. Thanks for that, Peter. Yeah, I was one of the two Extinction Rebellion representatives on the stewarding group. 
and we were there right the way through till just before the first um, the first assembly weekend. So we were working incredibly hard <laughs> right the way through from March till um, till October uh, in monthly student group meetings and between those meetings. So, for example, we proposed a deliberative event where the student group would decide on the question uh, for the assembly and brought experts in on the climate science and on deliberation to present to the student group uh, to arrive at the question that was arrived at. So we worked very hard and we only pulled out right at the end just before the assembly got going because it was really clear to us that the assembly was not going to be allowed to consider the breadth of evidence it needed to consider. And for that, we mean it needed to be able to consider radical transformation as well as mainstream, as well as doing nothing. We weren't opposed to anything being in there. We were just really clear that we needed to have the range in there for assembly members to be able to consider. So we left just before it began, having done as much work as we could without then being linked to the outcome, which we felt would be too weak. And in fact, I would suggest that the members' response, the government's response suggests that actually it was too weak a process because it hadn't considered the government's own policies beforehand. And that's why a lot of us are engaged now in putting together a, an assembly process for Scotland, but not just on the climate, but on the system that's driving the climate crisis and the uh, multiple other crises that we face of poverty and homelessness and all these ridiculous things that don't need to exist, except that we're in such an unequal system, which we need to change. Thank you. You're muted now, Pam. Thank you. Sorry, Julie Christie. Hi, I don't know how I can follow what Justin's just said. Um, well said, Justin. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering about the process of participatory budgeting and um, putting communities in control of how local or government funds are spent. I know that's not um, an easy process either if the terms of reference for engaging communities in that process is set by the government agencies themselves. Um, but I think there's an obvious link up here um, with citizens' assemblies and the devolving of budgetary responsibilities. So I just wondered if anybody in Scottish Government or other uh, bodies represented tonight is, is able to say anything on that really. And particularly, I think I've heard about green particip participatory budgets. I don't know very much about them, but I wondered if anybody else did. Thanks, Pam. Francesca. Is anybody able to talk to that? I, I can say a little bit about, I don't know tons about the, the Scottish experience of participatory budgeting. What I do know is it's, um, you know, one of the few countries, certainly the only one in the UK to, to what we call mainstream it, which means a certain amount of um, council budgets are now allocated to be spent via participatory budgeting. So that's, I think, is a great step forward. I think absolutely, and this is this is kind of the point that I, I was trying to um, highlight in, in in my concluding comments. That you know, citizens' assemblies are, are I think, useful for um, climate change governance, but we need other avenues to get the public involved and, and participatory budgeting is a very useful way. And it brings slightly different things than a, 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 a citizen's assembly would. So you're more likely to get people who are already politically engaged, involved, I guess, and people who are already coming with certain types of views, but you can still get deliberation within the participatory budgeting process if done well. But it's also more of an aggregative way where people vote for their different options of, of spending. And, and and certain options of spending the people who put that forward may be able to mobilize more people via networks and connections. So there's 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 uh, some, some elements of inequality and exclusion in it as well, but I do think it's a really useful way and, and we should have more of it. In contrast, the advantage of a citizen assembly is because it uses um, random selection or, 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 or sortition, basically a, lot of, a lottery type way of, of selecting means it, 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 you do get different types of people that you don't with a more open call for participation, um, such as through, through PB. Thanks, Stephen. And we've got Francesca with us, who I'm reliably informed is a, a green participatory budgeting expert. Would you like to tell us some more, Francesca? Yes, absolutely. Although I don't, I would use the term expert a wee bit loosely please and there's lots of pressure goes on when you do that um so i'm francesca i'm the green pb lead within scottish community development center 
Um, and this year is really the first year that we have started to look at how participatory budgeting could be linked to the climate change agenda and how it could basically raise the awareness around about climate change whilst looking at how it can be used as a driver for climate change as well. Kind of agree with what Stephen's saying. That participatory budgeting, I don't see replacing citizens assemblies, but what Julie just alluded to is I think it would work very well hand in hand with them potentially, especially through the dialogue and deliberation. Any good PB process should have a good part of dialogue and deliberation written in right from the start. And that's where the ideas generation comes from and all that kind of thing. But as you know, we're voting, depends on the process, how it's run. There's good processes, there's bad processes. In Scotland, we have been looking at participatory budgeting for now between eight and 10 years. You're right, we're mainstreaming it. It's a different process sometimes in the mainstream, but it really has been gaining a lot of traction as a kind of well, God, participatory democracy approach to spending. And what I will say for PB is I'm a big fan because it's the most mobilised I've ever seen people get round about as if they feel that they have some sharing of power on the budget. So it really is a fantastic way to get people interested in whatever you're talking about. We've been running a programme for almost a year now, just looking at the exploration round about it. There's very few examples of green participatory budget at the minute because it is a new concept. However, they are building this year with, I think somebody's alluded to in the the chat box just transitions in the northeast has just announced a, announced a million pound budget to be disseminated between three local authorities all in relation to climate change activity at a localized level we also have places like dundee city council using participatory budget for their climate change plan as well over the next four years and also smaller parts of work so we're definitely seeing a move towards participatory budget and being included in that climate change agenda and the climate actions and the conversations and part of the reason I'm here tonight is just to see the learning around about it and, and see where I could further that so I've gave you an overload of information I think Julie you're on the mark I think we need to look at it as a way to further the climate change agenda I think it works very well with other stuff that's there and if anybody's got any questions feel free to ask hopefully I'll be able to answer them or comments I'm, I'm happy to sit here and chat. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Alison Stewart, you have some direct experience recently, I believe. Not experience. In fact, I think Fabio's got the experience on, on the call of actually doing it in practice in Mori. So we could, she could get him to speak next. But I just wanted to, to uh, say what's in the chat is right. Um, myself uh, with the, uh, the three TSIs in Aberdeen City, Aberdeenshire and, and Mori, which Fabio helps head up are all taking part in the Just Transition participatory budgeting that's going to start open up on the 26th in Aberdeen City and Shire, I do believe, um, where we, we're actually trialling uh, a considerable amount of money, so 333,000 in each like public public area, public uh, local authority area. Um, so that'll be quite interesting. It's, yes, third sector interfaces, TSI. And um, I think that's going to be really quite interesting to do. Unfortunately, it's, it's having to be done rather fast, so it won't be done as well as we might like it. But as Francesca says, I feel that's really important that we have deliberative aspects, and hopefully, in, in future years, we'll be able to build them into into things like climate assemblies or legislative theatre or things like that, so that we have that the the community thinking about what they want and then having the money to do that with people voting what they really really want to do on top of that. I think is really quite important because a lot of times if you don't have that aspect it can just be the kind of usual suspects that come into the fore and and you, it'd be great to actually build uh, new community groups that want to do different things um, and obviously it does depend on whether it's a capital income fund at the moment the the, the fund that we're, we're doing in the northeast is a purely capital fund which for community groups in particular is is quite difficult and limiting but you know it's, it's better than a kick in the teeth basically and I'm really happy to have it but I wonder if you might want to come in Fabio well happy to come in up to a point um if there is no one I know Derek had his hand up and Derek wondered if you wanted to uh, make a contribution um, I, I think everyone was having a, a, a good chat around local participatory and deliberations, etc. I was 
going to ask a question about more of the national um, citizens assembly. So I thought I'd leave everyone to discuss this for the moment because this is interesting for me too. But um, maybe I can ask that question later. Okay, yeah, we'll come back to you. And I was going to say that, um, yeah, maybe Fabio, if you could give us some of your um, experience and then we'll we'll move on to, oh, and I see Eva's hand is up though. I was gonna say, maybe we should move off of participatory budgeting and uh, scan events, make a note that maybe we need a session on that. Um, but Fabio, where have you gone on my screen? There you are, please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, so um, there is a lot to be, to share about what we've been doing in Mari and what we're about to do in relation to PB um, and uh, in relation to engaging folks uh, on anything to do with climate, climate change, climate action. And I, I'm not sure that I've got anything that I could contribute in a nutshell. Um, I'm, I'm, there are a number of things that we have done in relation to PB in general, not just green PB, uh, which really involve animation of communities. So support for communities, community capacity building, um, and particularly engaging with people um, who are least likely to engage um, in, in any other form of participatory democracy, uh, particularly with a, um, a program we run for a few years uh, on drug and alcohol and on, on uh, mental health and, and well-being. In terms of Green PB, um, we have done a participatory grant making process last year with a very small pot of money uh, and, 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 and a built on an engagement with folks based on kind of running a three series event, climate cafes, um, a kind of vis visualization um, exercise in terms of a carbon neutral future. Uh, and then a storytelling session in, in how to de-articulate and communicate the vision for that future and the process to get there. And, and then had a, a wee bit of money to give out through participatory grant making, uh, having stimulated interest um, uh, and to be fair, I think uh, that particular exercise, um, given it was again on a very short uh, period of time, uh, really engaged with folks who were already thinking um, along, in, along climate change. So we think that the just transition won't have time for deliberation as much as we would like uh, this year. Uh, hopefully it'll have more time in future years. But certainly what we're going to try to do is to reach out to communities right across Murray, in our case, uh, and um, who may not see the relevance of what they do to climate change until that's kind of um, articulated, and particularly the just transition, the just part of a transition. Um, so we're, we're hoping that we'll generate more interest in, mm. in the issue and that we will get uh, more people to engage with the idea. And the other great thing about participatory budgeting, it tells you what's important to people, what is it people are thinking about. So mm -hmm. it, through the process of engagement, the money is really important, but it's not to be all and end all, it's actually what you hear from people that matters to them in the place they're in and the place mm -hmm. they're at, uh, and yeah. what can you get from there. And I don't think we are, um, certainly mm -hmm. at TSI Mari, we haven't quite cracked yet how to extract the maximum amount of intelligence from that, uh, mm. but, but we're working on that. So, mm. yeah. Thank you, I, I thank you for that. For English, but I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you. Um, Sophia, just before I go to you, I'm gonna ask Derek if he'd like to come in with his question now, and then we'll go to you, Sophia. Oh, okay, um, thanks. Um, well, I suppose in a way it's it's a little bit like back to the start. Um, if um, with the benefit of hindsight, could the question um, posed to the Citizens Assembly have been different to elicit more deliberative discussions around the system changes that are needed 
to deliver across all the kind of climate injustices, social injustices, et cetera, that have been, have been outlined previously. And, and, and I suppose that leads on to, you know, if the a National Assembly was um, mooted again, um, obviously, as we've discussed, it, it would have to be convened by the citizens also uh, in order to make it worthwhile going ahead with it. But, um, but yes, what, what question would it be around economic systems? Would it be, is there a specific focus that could be, um, well, that, that could be taken that, that would elicit, you know, the deliberations and recommendations that, that we need in the short space of time that we need them? Um, so I'll have a first go at responding, Derek, and, and others can chip in. Um, but I'm going to answer it slightly differently to the way that you asked it. Um, so, so climate change obviously is a vast topic, um, hugely complex. All these interconnections, you know, it's really difficult to just focus on one thing without everything else becoming part of it. Um, one of the issues is how much do assembly members need to know and need to understand in order to come up with well-informed recommendations on any topic within climate change you know is it you know you could study for decades and still not have a full understanding of everything so um what um one of so several people that we interviewed um from different parts of the organizing um group so you know not not just evidence group or our design team or whatever but several people kind of had a view that what could have happened so whether so yes the question is very broad um and it's impossible to answer it fully in seven weeks even probably in seven months <laughs> um so it was what it was what could happen um in another um example is that um and what what was proposed was that um for the first couple um sessions the members are then presented with kind of, well why 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 is why is it called an emergency right so that's where they're kind of presented with with the real sort of hard hitting facts and and what is currently happening in terms of impacts in other parts of the world um where it's more severe and um and from there to determine well what are the strategic priorities <clears throat> and then um so wh where you know what are the leverage points where you can have a big effect if you focus on that thing or these things um, so that could have been a, a process that was then that was facilitated and the members could then have decided, well, what are our strategic priorities um, from a, a Scottish perspective? And then to, you know, focus in on them, um, understanding what is current policy like on this and given what we've now learnt about the seriousness of everything, um, what needs to be changed about that current policy or what new things need to happen and um, the actual topics themselves should emerge out of that process you know and then that would result in in recommendations um if the whole process was then sort of followed through in that way with that that, that, that were more strategic basically so that's that's one approach that you know some of our interviewees were um proposing and i'd tried to suggest um in the early part of the assembly itself uh they'd put some of those views forward so that's one one response to, to, to what you said there because clearly you can't do everything um okay. i'm sure the others have got uh other ideas that they'd like to put in yeah, i'm happy to give the opposite Thanks, nadine um justin if, if i could just say we've got a couple of people who've been waiting super patiently but if you have the direct response, if you could make it quite quick, we're reaching the end. Yes, I don't think the question was the problem, though you could have a question that was about how does Scotland change to tackle the 
to tackle the system driving the climate and related emergencies. And that can speak to people's immediate experience, their experience of fuel poverty, their experience of poverty, their experience of you know, depression, their, all, all, whatever experience they can come from their real experience. And just kind of giving the opposite point of view to Nadine's, because it's important to have that within a debate. Um, I think it's a very simple question. It's not a complicated question. Climate change, the, the mechanics and the science of that is very complex, but the fact that we're pumping fossil fuels into the atmosphere and we're tearing up the soil, and destroying the ocean, this is a simple process that's driven by an economic system and a belief that we're separate from the earth and that we can do this to, to others, other people elsewhere in the world too, without facing the consequences. That's a really simple thing to grasp. And then the consequences of that are pretty straightforward and they're really transformative. I think that can be done in seven weekends, no problem, if you actually follow it through really clearly, which is what we propose, as it's are, we propose a way of doing it, which wasn't picked up on, because obviously the status quo need, shouldn't be disturbed too much in that context, according to those who are running it, which is why I think we have to do this as a, as a citizens-owned process, rather than a government-devolved process. Mm. That, that's quick thank enough. You. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Sophia, thank you for waiting. Hi, um, I think it was Justin who was speaking earlier about um, how the Citizens' Assembly um, ended up being convened by the government and therefore in some ways had to fit within a certain framework. Um, I sort of wear two hats. My first hat is around community activism and organizing, but my second is um, I was involved in the facilitation of children's participation in the in Scotland's Climate Assembly. And it, it was the first Climate Citizens' Assembly in the world to involve children. Although this is one group of people who maybe often gets excluded from especially uh, democratic processes, but even deliberative democracy. So that was that was amazing. That was special. But I guess I do have questions around, uh, I think, the theoretical and political approach to having a citizens assembly that really is led by citizens and designed by the people on the ground in the assembly. It, that is the, to me, the correct moral and political way of approaching it. But how do you, I guess my question would be, how would you involve people who don't have the skills or the access or the geographical location or the age to be involved in something that um, I guess, you know, could be intimidating or located in a certain place? I guess the benefit of the structure was having a very something very clear cut and safe and easy for people to engage with. I, I guess I just have questions around how, how that would work. I see Eva's finger up there. I, I could just respond a bit to that. Um, really, sort of what, what you're touching on here is is one of the bits of this whole thing that interests me the most, or at least one one element of it. Um, because I think what I think our whole training in this society is really about how to do what we're told um, and that there are some big people who know what's what and who you should who, who know the right answer and that um, most of us should just fall into line behind that whether that's our parents or our teachers or people in the government at, at, at quite a sort of deep psychological level for a lot of people and I, I would include myself I, I, I am quite um, quite uh, uh, vulnerable to being uh, impressed by authority. So it's a, a bad habit that I'm trying to unlearn. Um, and one of the um, one of the elements that I'm interested in is so how do we uh, create processes that aren't intimidating, that do allow us to show up as we are and as who we are, uh, and let and encourage people to kind of be a bit self-reflexive. And think about like what's going on for me in this situation. So we're putting quite a lot of effort into thinking about those kind of elements of design and facilitation that mean that uh, people whose habit is to step back and to think, oh, my voice isn't worth listening to, feel really, really welcome and feel really encouraged uh, and space is made for them to step forward and to make points. I think this whole process of, of uh, deliberative democracy is deeply educational. Um, I think there's a lot for all of us to learn about what it is to have a healthy relationship with power. Um, and so I think within these processes, there's a lot that we can do to make them less formal, uh, still structured and still, and still um, uh, careful to make sure that we're on track. 
but actually to take some of that kind of power over approach out of them. But I also think that there's a whole massive area. I mean, we mostly what we talk about when we talk about assemblies is like the, 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 the design and the process and then the outputs. Actually, 90% of the work that you do for an assembly is what, is what you do beforehand. And this is exactly where the kind of groups that you're talking about um, can be engaged much, much earlier in the process um, and where you can you know, potentially do particular work with people in smaller groups um, to introduce them to ideas of assembly, to introduce them to the kind of themes and topics that might be spoken about and to find out what's going to make an assembly process accessible before it, before it ever happens. Um, so those are the kind of things I've been thinking about. Mm. Thanks, Eva, and thanks, Sophia, for bringing it in. I love the children's participation, uh, the children's parliament's participation in the uh, in the Me assembly. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. I mean, they had very straightforward, very realistic responses that, uh, yeah, we could all listen to probably. Um, moving on to Howard, who's been patiently waiting. Um, thanks very much, Pam. Loads of interesting stuff. Um, pretty much everybody who speaks, I'd like to respond. And just immediately on Sophia's comments, um, the area that I'm involved with is um, um, pupils at schools are being involved in the Global Schools Summit. And prior to COVID, we were actually thinking of having citizens' juries around Scotland, which would be local and just involve uh, young people. So it wasn't so much of speaking and be, um, it would expand. But anyway, that um, really interested in that as an idea. Um, thinking about the three levels so national level the one thought that i i do have and i keep thinking that the one shot climate assembly seems to be quite a limited model so you've got to do it at one time have it planned and then get everything that follows and you know some of the comments about stuff being out of date within a couple of months suggest it's possibly not the right way to go um, just associated with that i'm definitely interested in putting more emphasis on monitoring. We've seen this repeatedly that government policies are just not so much that they've got the wrong policies, is even when they've got a reasonable policy, they don't implement it. So just having that repeated return to the issue would make a big difference. Um, the local, um, I, I don't know what has been done on the local level, but uh, a couple of thoughts that have struck me about the local is, um, again, this could be something that you could really reduce costs with. As with the uh, citizens' jury that I was uh, starting to think of before COVID for Scottish schools, I thought that the citizens' assembly actually provided a lot of material. So if you actually reused material, that might um, save some money. You could also think of uh, local place-based um, citizens' juries that tackle a sub subsections part of the overall set of topics that you want to address. And I thought just moving it around the country with a group of 25 people in Stirling and then 25 people in the islands and then 25 people somewhere else tackling different topics is way that you would think actually maybe you could cover all these things and keep the material in the public eye not just have a one one um, activity and trying to get all the media on that topic at one time um, and the third thing was that um, justin talking about an international assembly which this is something that I am involved with now is international engagement with young people. So uh, the event that we're doing has got kids from Malawi and kids from Nepal and kids from Scotland. And last year we had kids from Mozambique. And when you start dealing with those groups, the international topics no longer look like purely mitigation is adequate. That just does not feel appropriate. There's obviously topics around water security, 
food security, inequalities. So many of the other topics, as soon as you go up, if you scale up towards something that's international, it forces you. I think you cannot just stick with a mitigation focus. It just doesn't, it doesn't feel right. So um, I think the first, turning them into questions, the first one, what about thinking of something that isn't a one-shot citizens assembly? Local, could you think of it local as being a rolling local that does have a national plan? And I, well, I don't really have a question around the international. It just seems uh, just a comment more on the international issue. Hmm. Okay, thank you, Howard. And um, Fabio, do you have a question or a response to something? Uh, was actually a question, um, a question looking forward, and a, almost a, a request of scan for the okay. potentially. Can you hold session. that? Okay, hold that just for a minute. And um, can someone respond to Howard's question, or is that maybe what Justin just put in the in the chat? Sorry, I can't help but respond. So I just respond in the chat as a way of not speaking. <laughs> okay, that's great. So, okay, so Howard's question's been responded to. Excellent. And so, yes, Fabio, over to you now. Thank you. Uh, I guess my, well, there is a question for SCAN or, or almost a request of SCAN. Um, I, I, I think, so in my view and in my experience, um, I agree with Justin institutions are designed to keep the status quo and to make the status quo work. Some of them are better at making the status quo work than others, uh, but that's their main function. The real push for change and seems to me to be coming from communities. So what processes can we use and how can assemblies and uh, deliberative approaches help in, in, in getting people to put pressure on institutions to change and, and, and system change is what we do need. Um, so we need to value the, the, the really important things rather than money um, and growth and all that kind of stuff that really doesn't, doesn't help. So what processes will help and how can assemblies and deliberative mm -hmm. processes help in, in doing that, both in, in generating action on the ground that demonstrates different ways of being and, and, and interacting and living and connecting and in putting pressures on, on politicians and institutions to mm. bring about the change that we need. Okay. And I see Justin with your finger up there, but I was actually going to go to Eva because I think Eva is doing something with SCAN on this. It's at the peripheries of my knowledge, but it's probably what you're going to say anyway, Justin. So. Uh, who knows? <laughs> um, we've been, we are, uh, we being um, grassroots to global slash open source, which is a kind of like slightly overlapping two groups that we're working with, uh, are developing a training for um, local communities who want to run assemblies, um, which kind of take people through like, you know, the, the very start of the idea, like well, how might you frame your assembly and who are you going to reach out to, the kind of things that we were talking about before, about um, making sure that you engage with hard to reach groups. So these are all, these are all this is looking at people's assemblies, um, which loosely are, are, you know, you can categorize assemblies really in terms of who gets to turn up. And people's assemblies is anyone can turn up and basically want as many people as possible, because that gives you the diversity that in a, a, a citizens' assembly you kind of legislate for with using sortition. You you get diversity by by uh, selecting people by social group. Um, so that's the that's the kind of thing that we're looking at just now. I actually was just speaking to Philip today and talking about well maybe uh, an event around assemblies would be a really good way to. Uh, raise awareness and uh, talk more about the kind of assemblies that we can do in communities, this kind of citizen-led angle, um, and also maybe a kind of shorter workshop rather than the training that we've got at the moment is, is three days, and it's quite a big ask for people who maybe aren't totally sold 
on on this idea quite yet. So yeah, there's there's lots in the pipeline in terms of being able to support people at very different uh, stages of their journey. Um, and we are also third pathway looking uh, to talk with other people, other organizations, other movements about how we could convene something that felt really bottom up in Scotland, really citizen led, really informed by a really wide diversity of communities around the kind of fundamental questions that Justin was asking, like what is driving the, the, the system of which climate change is just one symptom along with poverty and inequality and a whole bunch of other things. What's driving it and how do we stop it in our country? Uh, it feels like high time we should be asking ourselves that question. Mm. Thank you, Eva. And with just a minute left, I'm afraid I'm going to take up the time and um, thank some people. Um, also to say, there's been a lot of amazing information and links popped into the chat through this. And um, Joanna is going to make sure that uh, that gets saved and sent out to everyone. We have been recording this, so if you know of anybody else who's interested in this topic, please let them know. It'll be on our uh, website. Um, yeah, I mean, it really has sounded to me like throughout that we need to continue this dialogue um, and maybe make a more participatory space for it next time. But I really wanted to thank Nadine, first of all, for suggesting to SCAN that we hold this event um, and to um, Nadine and Stephen for all their hard work um, researching what happened and um, reporting it so clearly for all of us. Um, and thank you to Eva and Justin for bringing um, your perspectives as well. And thank you to everybody else, um, those who participated, those who didn't, thank you for staying on and uh, listening. And I, you know, this is a really, really important step, I think, I think personally, um, toward getting that more local, more participative democracy happening in Scotland. And I, you know, as an American looking in, I've been in for a while, but I think Scotland has a really good chance of doing these sorts of things where, you know, a, a larger country might not. 